I study my students, they work with me to study themselves sometimes. And the one thing I've noticed is that regardless of how we imagine the project of education, the main project that these students are up to when they're sitting in our classrooms is meaning seeking. And they, they're doing this, they're trying to find a place in the world, they're trying to seek meaning, significance, purpose, and identity, all of those things. They're doing those things with such creativity and vigor because we live in a society in which those things are not automatically given to them. We live in a society in which identity and recognition are not given, so you have to find them. So that's what they're up to. And so if you think then about like whether or not we are helping them in this endeavor, whether or not they're really engaged with us and, and so on, you just have to pay attention to their questions. So if you pay attention to their questions, if they're asking um, <coughs> questions of, you know, imagine like the questions of the quester, somebody who's on a great quest, that's a certain type of question. Uh, I started paying attention to the questions that the students were asking here, and they started at, and the, they were questions like this, how many points is this worth, how long does this paper need to be, what do we need to know for this test? Clearly this is not the questions of somebody who is on a voracious quest for learning, right? This is a problem. Um, and you know, it's not just this generation. Uh, if you look at these students here, this, this you know, here's the same students here, the Samaritan Idol edition. Um, I'm not sure if you notice the difference. Uh, but clearly this is, not, this, this is not a generational thing. I mean, there's a lot of energy and engagement to be had. It's just they're not finding it in the classroom. And so I actually, uh, every year I do a survey with my students. I ask them a really simple question. How many of you do not actually like school? And inevitably I get over half of them to raise their hands. This is at a major university. Students are paying good money to go here. And they actually don't like it. Um, I changed the question a little bit. I asked, how many do not like learning? And I get no hands. So this is a really devastating critique of our system here, in which we created an institution for learning, and people who love learning don't like the institution. Uh, this survey actually works pretty well with professors, too. So this is a, <laughs> this is a problem. Um, I've, uh, we did this sort of open forum one day where we just had a camera swung around the room, and people could uh, send messages out to the world through, through the camera. And they sent, said things like this, I buy $100 textbooks that I never open, my neighbor paid for class but never comes. We did a survey, uh, and this was across the university, we found that they complete only 49% of the readings that are assigned to them, and even worse, they find only 26% relevant to their lives, which is like a 74% failure rate on our part. And then there are things like this, I bring my life to the class. And uh, this was actually, this, this actually happened just as she put this up. Uh, her friend I enter in the corner, so this was a legitimate uh, confession. Um, there's not a lot of Facebook through most of my classes. And these last two actually indicate something else, right? And that is that there's something in the air. There's literally something in the air. And that something in the air can be summarized as nearly the entire body of human knowledge and human connection floating in the air all around them. I mean, this is what they can reach out to at any moment. And you might be able to sort of picture it like this. This is like the new media state in which we live. It exists all around us in the air, all around us. And this is really just the beginning, because you all know that we're headed towards ubiquitous computing, ubiquitous communication, ubiquitous information, and one speak about everything everywhere from anywhere and all kinds of devices. <laughs> all of which makes it ridiculously easy to connect, organize, share, collect, collaborate, and publish to anyone in the world or with anyone in the world. And that makes exams like this look really silly. <laughs> and I've sort of tried to summarize this with a clever little turn of phrase where I say that we need to move from being knowledgeable to being knowledgeable, which is not just to know a bunch of stuff, but to actually be able to find, sort, analyze, critique, and even create information and knowledge in this new media scape. But today I'd like to talk about how limited even that is, and how we need to go even beyond that. Knowledgeability cannot just be about information literacy, it's more than that. It's also more than just critical thinking. We have to move beyond those things. And I'm going to try to create a sort of triangle of, of things that I think students need to master in our classrooms, <coughs> we need to create in our classrooms. And I'll start with communication. That would include everything that you normally put under information literacy, media literacy, and so on. But add to that thoughtfulness, that would include critical thinking, it would include a large knowledge base, and so on. It also would include things like uh, rich imagination and creativity. And adding to those two things, I'd also like to add empathy. 
And I'd like to point out that these three things are intimately interconnected. That the more we communicate, the, the more we learn from one another, the, the more our thoughtfulness grows. The more we can grow knowledge, the more, and, and the more knowledge we grow, that knowledge becomes like the fodder and fuel to, that fuels our imagination, which allows us to imagine another person's point of view. And once you are inside another point, another person's point of view, you can communicate better. And this thing works backwards the other way too. So the more you see somebody else's point of view, the more you can revise your own theories and schemas that are organizing your knowledge, which in turn help you communicate better with those people. So th these things are all interconnected, and we have to build all three of these in our classrooms. And when we do that, we can actually create a transformative process for our students, in which they see that that meaning-seeking that they've been up to is actually slightly misguided. That you are not going to find yourself, you are not going to find meaning, you are not going to find your place in the world. You are going to make meaning. You are going to create yourself. You are going to create your place in the world. And once we move them through that transformational process where they become not receptive uh, searchers, but actually active creators, then we've really done something great. And we have fulfilled that, that the principal uh, purpose of education, which Mary Warnock once said in 1978, it is the main purpose of education to give people the opportunity of not ever being bored. And because they're not bored because they are creators in the world. They see themselves as co-creators of the world, and they see not only its beauty, but also its problems, and they're actively uh, engaging with it uh, constantly. So, all that has to happen within this world of new media. So we need to understand something about new media. So everything I've learned about new media, I've actually learned in Papua New Guinea, which is a place where you would not expect to learn much about new media. Um, I'll just take you in for a little virtual tour real quick. Um, if you can, when I go to my field site, you fly into a little um, airstrip like this, and it takes about two weeks to two months to get there because you have to, you know, you jump on a little puddle jumper Cessna to get there. Um, you have to wait for the next plane to go in and so on. Then you walk for two days and you end up in villages that look like this. And these are villages that are completely off the grid. There's no electricity, there's no running water, there's no 3G access, no internet, none of that. And I, from 1998 to 2006, I was going there almost every summer, and then I spent about a year there in 2002, 2003. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll just show you some around the village here. This is uh, how they make their living. They, there's no money, they, they just grow their own foods, carrots, sweet potato, bananas. Uh, they raise pigs, so this is like a big feast there. They're also opportunistic, so after a big rain, uh, the, the rain will wash down the spider webs and they can harvest the spiders and the eggs and they'll eat those. Uh, they're also opportunistic when it comes to snakes. Uh, snakes are a great deal because you can get sort of like a two-for-one deal. Um, that you usually capture a large snake like this after it's eaten. It gets kind of lazy to digest its food, so you kill the snake and you pull the thing that it just ate out as an appetizer. And then uh, you have this great meal. Now, I take this picture of the snake because it was actually found about 100 feet from where I was staying, which is this house right over here. And it was in be my first week while I was there. And I'll just take it inside the hut to show you what it looks like. This is These are actually my legs up in the upper right hand corner with uh, my sleeping bag there on the right. Um, and so. We found this snake like 100 feet away, and so I was kind of nervous, you know, because I've only been there like a week. I'm looking around this little hut, and there's holes everywhere in the hut, and I think, watch well, this little snake can come in here any time. And so every night, up until that point, I'd already been wrapping myself up in my sleeping bag super tight because of all the bugs and so on, but it's the tropics, and it gets really hot in the middle of the night, so the sleeping bag comes off of me, and I have to brush off all the bugs and tighten myself back up in the sleeping bag again. And, but this night I'm especially worried because, you know, my snake farm is really bad because I just ate this snake and it's just a hundred feet away and you know, it's like his friends and family might come <laughs> for revenge. I don't know what's going to happen. So, uh, that night, you know, I grabbed myself up in my sleeping bag super tight, covered my head, everything, I'm just totally sealed up. But, you know, I get really hot in the middle of the night, my sleeping bag comes off of me and I wake up in the middle of the night and there's this thing across my chest, it's like this big around. It's just laying across my chest. And so I managed to get it with my left hand. I'm totally freaking out. But I grab it with my left hand. I throw it down on the ground. But as I throw it, I go with it. 
And so I realized I'm wrapped up in this thing, like this thing somehow. So I managed to get it pinned down on the ground with my left hand. And I try to free my right arm so I can pin it down with my right arm, but I can't move my right arm. And it's at this moment I realized that I've actually pinned down my own right arm. <laughs> <laughs>
In fact, the, when a new medium comes into a society, everything changes regardless of whether or not you opt in or not. And so, and the reason for that is because media are not just tools. Media are not just means of communication. Media mediate relationships. So when media change, relationships change. And there's uh, this great quote here from Marshall McLuhan, we shape our tools, and thereafter our tools shape us. Um, there's a, here's a quote for this, for example, the effects of new media, you guys will be very familiar with these, so I don't need to spend much time on these. Uh, the role of expert is experts are challenged by new, newly empowered voices. New institutions emerge to deal with the social, cultural, and political changes. There's a struggle to revise social and legal norms. Concepts of identity and community multiply and transform. New forms of language arise. And there's increasing pressure on educators to prepare students for the new world that is emerging. And this is all, of course, from Elizabeth Eisenstein on the impacts of the printing press. This is even about new media today. So this is just another example of media change, relationships change. Uh, take television, for example. Look at how television changed the relationships in the family unit. Look at how it remaps our living rooms. And let's face it, this isn't just the living room anymore. This is the dining room. Look what happened to our dining rooms. Like suddenly all the chairs are turned and faced towards the television rather than towards each other. This is really re changing relationships here. And when you look to the television, you see that the conversations of our culture are happening here. Uh, Neil Postman has a great analysis of this in Amusing Ourselves, 1985. Uh, he goes on to point out that the conversations are controlled by the few and designed for the masses. The conversations are always entertaining, uh, even the serious ones. They have to be in order to get people's attention. The conversations are punctuated by 30-second commercials. And these conversations create our culture. And Neil Postman summarized this as saying that in the world in which television was the dominant medium, the conversations created a culture of irrelevance, incoherence, and impotence. Uh, he goes on to point out it's a one-way conversation. You have to be on TV to have a voice. You have to be on TV to be significant. And therefore, it would probably be no surprise then to see thousands of young people lining up in front of television cameras because that's where they find significance and meaning and so on. And it, all of this is really just a part of this search for identity and recognition. And all of it is happening in a world that is just saturated with media. This overwhelming saturation of media. And it hits our kids, uh, like, you know, just, just uh, there's so many descriptions of this, like uh, Don DeLillo calls it the noxious cloud, or uh, Thomas de Zingotita calls it the blob. It just comes at kids. Uh, here's a great uh, video showing this. This is from Dove. Some of you may have seen this before. And it just shows like this young girl and then the medium blitz coming at her, right? And obviously this can be very harmful in, in that key moment in which they are searching for identity and recognition and who are they going to be. This, this media onslaught is done. Teachers everywhere rightfully took on the mantle of, uh, like we have the mantle of, we have to take on critical thinking. We have to create our students with more critical thinking, just if for no other reason than to limit the effects of this media onslaught. And then, of course, when the new media uh, blitz came, uh, you, know, you have all this new uh, this new landscape of information and so on. The calling became a bit different. It wasn't just critical thinking. We also needed information literacy. And the reason we needed information literacy is because digital information is different than information on television or information in print. And so I made this video a few years ago to try to express some of this. Here I'm comparing text you know, on paper, uh, just writing, and, and then I, you'll see the eraser here and, and talk about text in digital form. And this video gets kind of geeky here, so I'm just going to speed it up, and a lot of you have probably seen it before. But it basically just looks up the difference between HTML and XML, and the sort of changes that are unleashed by that, the possibilities for participation in blogs and wikis and Twitter, uh, Flickr and, and so on. 
Uh, it goes on here to make the point that the web is no longer just linking information, it's linking people. And when you start thinking about it in those terms, when it's not just about information, but about linking people, then you recognize we're going to rethink, need to rethink <coughs> a number of things. And this is where I start to make the pitch. Oh, thanks. <laughs> this is where I'll, I'll start to make the pitch uh, that we need to move beyond information literacy because you saw a twist there, right? But it's not about information. It's not just information. It's about how we're connecting to each other. And there's no better way for me to explain this than to show you the journey of that video itself. So that video was made in this little farmhouse in Kansas in the basement. That's, that, uh, and it was made like on a cheap computer way slower than anything you have in your hands right now. Um, and it was made in collaboration with uh, a guy in the Ivory Coast named Dave's, his real name is Patrick. Um, he goes by the artist named Dave's. He produced some music which he released as, under a Creative Commons license which basically uh, gave me the right to use that music in my video. Um, so we were sharing and collaborating uh, across time and space to produce this thing. So I uploaded it on Wednesday. Uh, on Friday, it had 253 views, and I was crazy excited about this because as an anthropologist, if more than 200 people read your work, this is a really big deal. So, <laughs> so, so this is why I, I took the screenshot. I mean, I, I was really excited. I took the screenshot, I sent it off to my department head. You know, like, we were really excited about this. Um, and then uh, something interesting happened. Uh, you know, the next day it went up to a thousand views, and uh, this is, you know, this is what you call user-generated content, right? Like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of videos are uploaded every day, and that's user-generated content. This was one of those pieces, and by Saturday morning it had over a thousand views, and now I'm really obsessed with it. You know, so I'm just saying refresh, 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 to see like how many people are watching this thing, and. Uh, and it was really interesting was that it was doubling every time that I was hitting refresh now. So, I mean, this is an exponential growth at this point. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. What's going on? So I started looking around, and I found it on Dig. Uh, so on Dig, people can submit news stories, videos, whatever, and then they can dig it, they can vote it up, or they can bury it, they can dig it down. And every stuff, all the stuff that gets <coughs> dug to the top, like literally gets dug to the top, and people can see it then on the front page, and that's what had happened here. Uh, the video got dug enough that it came right to the front page of Dig, where tens of thousands of more people could actually see the video. And this is what you might call user-generated filtering. So it's not just about producing content, it's also about filtering all that content that's coming in as well. So there it is on the front page of Dig. Uh, it's also being tagged and being bookmarked on sites like Delicious. So, for example, somebody's watching the video here, they hit the bookmark button, but instead of just keeping their bookmarks on the computer, they're sharing them with the world and adding tags, which work as metadata, which, uh, which allow you to create lists like this that are basically co-created by all of us. And this is what you might call user-generated organization. So we're actually collectively organizing all of this uh, onslaught of data, data and information that's coming in. All that can then be pushed out through RSS feeds instantly, so this is not just about uh, organization, but also distribution. It's my, what you might call user-generated distribution. And a lot of this is happening accidentally, so as people are simply just blogging about it, um, they're actually sort of scoring a point for it in that algorithm of, of Google and Technorati, anything that's counting the links to run a search engine uh, is that every time you simply link to something, you're actually voting for it in those systems. And so Technorati actually monitors these things, and they have this viral video chart. You can see the same chart at viralvideochart.com. Here it is on Technorati, and you can see that uh, this is now Sunday morning, and my video made it in the top five. So now I'm really excited, you know, I'm getting refresh all the time. And I'm especially nervous because it's Super Bowl Sunday, and I'm thinking, you know, gosh, here we are, Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, will it get to number one? You know, before, before the Super Bowl commercials come in and wash out the entire top 20. And so I'm, I'm really nervous about this. And so um, I'm just hitting refresh, refresh, refresh. And here you see by noon that day, it actually made it to number one. So, <laughs> so it's interesting to compare them with the Super Bowl commercials, right? Because those cost a million dollars to produce. Those, that 30 seconds cost one million dollars to produce. 
And so Doritos had this great idea. They thought, well, okay, we live in this user-generated landscape. Why not just invite our customers, our users, to create the video for us? So they held a little video contest. And they had all these submissions from all over the world about, you know, just like vying for that, that Super Bowl spot. Just create a video, 30 seconds, we'll put it on the Super Bowl for you. And uh, they, you can actually see they, they got five selections here. And the reason why, they actually vetted this. Um, the editors took in all these hundreds and thousands of, of, of contributions and then edited it down to five and then you could vote on the top five. And the reason why they didn't let the other ones out is because, you know, maybe they were concerned about what happened to Chevy. I don't know if you remember this. This is uh, Chevy created this platform where you could actually take clips of their Tahoe, make your own commercial, add your own little lines on there. Based on paper 
And if you think of, rethink how you could create government now uh, in, a, in a wiki world, a wiki government, things start to look really different. And so there's a lot of interesting uh, things happening over at the Do Tank, for example, at NYU, where they're reimagining how governments could actually happen. And of course, we're really when you then take this mobile and you realize that we have a ubiquitous context of where semantic social network of things, people, and information. I know it's a lot to take in, but just like just imagine what this means here. You know, it's not just about you know suddenly things like umbrellas become computers. You know, they talk about Moore's law and how computers are getting faster and faster and faster. Well, at the same time, those old computers are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So you can now buy a 486 com uh, computer chip. The state of the art of the mid 90s is now like 51 cents. And if you and when, it's, and when something's that cheap as a designer, you can say, hmm, do I want to make my umbrella into a computer? And that, yeah, that might be useful. What they do is they just put a little LED in the end that communicates with old cell phone towers in the area and gets one little piece of information. Is it going to rain today? And if it's going to rain, your, your umbrella glows blue. And you don't know if it's going to rain. So this is, you know, this network of things is very uh, rich and interesting possibility. Uh, and then, of course, all of the objects that are being produced today uh, are coming out now with two-dimensional barcodes or RFID chips. All of those things essentially make those things into URLs. They, they create basically hyperlinks in the real world. And that's not just a way to get information. You, it's not just about taking a picture of that and getting information with your cell phone. You can actually tag those things. You can leave information on those things. You can add metadata to those things. And suddenly, the world itself is, is sort of enveloped into the new media of the web. So, and ultimately, of course, this is not just about linking information, it's about linking people, and that means we need to rethink really big things too. So, I'd like to just take you into a video that explains a lot of this, or just at least as a great example of some of the changes we've seen. So this is a true story of one man. He's like the quintessential lonely individual who's off in the UK. He comes home uh, to Sydney, and there's nobody there to hug him at the airport. So he goes down to the mall with this free hug sign, and he just is like looking for a hug. And finally, somebody comes up to him and gives him a hug. So now this is where it gets interesting. It starts to spread. Other people start taking up the sign. They start holding it up. Other people are hugging each other. And this is about where it would stop in the days before new media, right? <laughs> so this gets posted to YouTube tens of millions of views later. This thing spreads worldwide. And so for the last three and a half years now, these events have been happening all over the world. This is a great example of how sort of individual action, individual action inspires collective action. And you see that taking place all over online all the time. But of course, I also want to mention that in the world of new media, in the world of YouTube and so on, there's also the farce, the, the sort of spoofster. And here comes the spoof here. <laughs> and sometimes these spoofs get really serious. Okay, so earlier I showed you that Dove commercial, right? It seems so powerful to talk about this media onslaught and how it hits our young people, and especially our young girls, and creates this false uh, and un unobtainable body image and so on. Uh, well, so there's an interesting remix of this that appeared on YouTube, some of you might have seen. <laughs> Deforestation that you saw in that video. 
So I think that's really powerful stuff. And, then, and so I want to show you, because I want, I want more and more and more people to be video literate. I want more and more people involved in this conversation. So I'm just going to show you real quick this little cooking segment of the show today. Um, I'm actually going to like show you like how to do this. So um, I took screenshots of it, uh, just in case we didn't have internet access. So you do a search for Dove Campaign for Real Beauty. You can download videos. These are fantastic videos on their own, uh, but they also deserve a little remixing. This is one of the a great ones to, this, to the song True Colors. And you can see it shows all these young girls who are just beautiful as can be, and they hate themselves because they don't match the uh, beauty industry standard. So here's the young girl who hates her freckles and so on. I'm going to download that just by typing PWN in front of YouTube up in the address bar. That will give me a link to the MP4 or the FLV. I'm going to download the MP4. And then I'm going to go over and I'm going to grab an Axe commercial because Unilever actually owns both Dove and Axe. And so I'm going to download some Axe commercials to sort of just sort of point out a little bit of hypocrisy in, the, uh, uh, in Unilever here. So here I am in my editor. And I'm just going to drag down these videos I just downloaded. There's True Colors. Okay, so there you see that video playing. I'm just going to crop it at the top. Now I'm going to drag down an Axe video. And I'm just going to lay that over the top here. In a sense to show like the uh, True Colors of uh, Unilever. And now I'm just going to add some text to explain what I'm doing. So now I'm just going to save it and I'm going to render it here. Just show you how fast this can all happen. Okay, I'm rendering it. And you know, we don't need to go any further with that because you know what happens next. We take it over to YouTube. We hit the upload button. And now next time somebody searches for a Dove campaign for, for uh, you know, beauty, they, they will actually see this video as well. Right? Somebody's actually already done a video like this. So there you go. Like two minutes, you can create a remix and enter the conversation. And this is... A, the point, right, that it's not a one-way conversation. It certainly doesn't have to be a one-way conversation. But, but creating it as more than a one-way conversation goes beyond information literacy. Here's another example I want to point out. This is weforum.org. This is we-forum.org. I don't know if you can see the difference. Uh, one is a spoof. One is the real thing. Um, this is the real thing. This is the spoof. Um, they look pretty darn similar. Uh, go into the spoof a little bit more. You can actually click on any of these videos and you get things like this. The source of our financial treasure was a violent plundering of the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> so he's actually, like, actually redubbed, right? Uh, I don't know if you guys know the Prime Minister in Canada, but he's very pro oil, so they redubbed him here as well. Quite frankly, think we've had enough investment in the uh, renewable energies and green development that's very essential. So we're going to come back our weak subservience to dirty oil and send a fatal blow to the carbon monopoly. And you see how like professional these are, right? These are really quite remarkably well done. Now, in the old days of information literacy, it would be all about like, okay, so where is this information coming from? This is a spook. Like, this isn't real information. We need to go to the real source and so on. But these guys are actually demonstrating something much more interesting. The guys who created this are called the Yes Men. Uh, they're like professional imposters, they call themselves. And they do really well at this. They, they do so well, in fact, that oftentimes news organizations are tricked into thinking of the real thing. And they're invited to come on to CNN, BBC, and all these places where they actually get to be the representatives of major world organizations. And the reason why I bring this up is because they're demonstrating something that, that is the exact thing that has to move us beyond just information literacy. They illustrate what Maxine Green called the social imagination. And the social imagination is the capacity to invent visions of what should be and could be in our deficient society, which is actually really hard to do. You have to be able to look at the world as if it could be otherwise, which is a very hard thing to do, very hard to get our students to do. And then you also have to be able to imagine a new world, a better world. And that is really key to 
any form of meaning making and world creating, which is where we want to get our students to be. So we're going to have to move from information literacy onto what you might call metamedia fluency, that is a sort of fluency with, with different forms of media, able to tell stories and, and, and have an impact in different media, uh, and then move on then from there to digital citizenship. This is, these are Garth Campbell's terms. And digital citizenship is really about harnessing and leveraging these tools, which make it ridiculously easy to do all these things so that we can make a better world. That's what digital citizenship is about. It's not just about finding information, it's about making a better world. And the reason why this is important is because we're really on this razor's edge right now. And on one side, you see all the good stuff, right? This new media, there's a lot of reason for optimism. You see freedom on the one side, but on the dark side, there's also new forms of control in this, in this new media environment. There's new possibilities for openness, but there's also new possibilities for surveillance. There's new possibilities for community, but there's also new ways to isolate ourselves. There's new possibilities for participation and engagement, but also <coughs> new ways of new forms of distraction. And so if we're really going to move forward, we have to lean towards the light side of this graph here. And I just want to point out that this is nothing more or less than what we make of it. If you don't like new media, if you don't like Wikipedia, all you have to do is change it. And that's what this is all about. So are we doing it in our classrooms? Are our classrooms working? Are they creating these world creators that we hope to create? So this is a little video we made in my class, and we simply started with this question, if these walls could talk, what would they say? It's the classic Dewey notion that you learn what you do. So if students learn what they do, what are they learning when they're sitting here? And when you think about the very structure of the room, it's sending a certain message, and that message is that one of those messages messages is that the information is up at the front of the room with the authority that you should follow along. You should follow that authority. And this is where we start to add a little twist here. Walls and desks can't talk, but students can. And what we've done here is we just created a Google document. And I invited, I just started with the question, what is it like being a student today? Added my students as the collaborators, all 200 of them. And we started editing this document. So here you see the edits as, as they're emerging. So a lot of you have seen this video, or you've seen um, especially pieces of it, because I started with some of the stuff at the beginning of this lecture today. So I won't show the whole thing, because you guys get the idea. These are the same messages you saw earlier. Um, what I do want to point out, though, is just as a little aside, that that little project, which took us just a week to do, is just a little side project within the broader framework of our course, you know, quickly raced to uh, 3 million views, it became the most blogged about video in the blogosphere, it was translated into Spanish, Italian, Greek, French, and Arabic, and it was on ABC News, all within just a matter of months. And that is yet another, you know, point of how it is ridiculously easy to connect, organize, share, collect, collaborate, and publish to the world. And meanwhile, we're in this room where these walls are telling us that to learn is to acquire information. Like, what a thin version of knowledge, right? That's so, so thin a definition of education. And secondly, that information is scarce and hard to find, and that's why you have to come to this central gathering place to get this information. Third, that you should trust authority for good information. Uh, fourth, that authorized information is beyond discussion. That's why the chairs don't turn towards one another. And finally, the real message here is that you should obey the authority and follow along. I think it's no wonder that somebody like Sean Ahmed would walk out. I don't know if you guys know who Sean Ahmed is. Sean Ahmed was a graduate student at Notre Dame, spent his whole life in the school system, and he gets to Notre Dame as a sociology graduate student, and he just wants to go change the world. That's all he wants to do. He sees problems in the world, he wants to change them. And the school system was just not giving him the outlets, so he walked out. And this is a video. Sean was in graduate school at Notre Dame when one day he decided that he needed to do something about world suck, and so he moved to Bangladesh. His project is called Uncultured, and he makes all these videos showing what poverty is really like in Bangladesh. <laughs> We're all far from lazy, so hopefully we can help him. And he's also been using money he was saving for an Xbox 360 to help kids go to school and to buy pencils and to do all kinds of amazing things. Boy, like it. Boy, like it. Okay. The mosquito bite on this kid. 
Absolutely, black is coming. Uh, you mention, uh, what strikes me as so amazing about Sean is that he realized that poverty isn't about them, it's about us, and he just went. So we're going to help him help people in Bangladesh. Hi, Sean. Hey, Sean. Hey, Sean. We donated to a very, very glad to do so. You guys, through your votes and video responses, will decide how I will be spending some of this donation money. Here is my vote. Rebuild the school. Too many, and their operation is moving too fast. He goes on to say that uh, it's 
helping get getting aid to people who need it most. So we're back to the chorus then of this talk. And the chorus of this talk is that it's ridiculously easy to connect, organize, share, collect, collaborate, and publish, and that should make a big difference in our classrooms. And yet our classrooms are sending this other message that we should obey the authority, follow along, that information is to be acquired, that's the pinnacle of learning, and so on. And somehow we need to change the message. So how do we change the message? Now, I do want to point out that technology alone is not the answer. And the best example of this is just to look in this picture right here. There is one really key technology that had the potential to change everything. It was released 15 years ago in the classrooms all over the nation. And it did virtually nothing but harm to the educational environment. And that's that little blue dot up at the top that represents the projector, right? So the projector, think about what that projector is. That's 1024 by 768. That's 786,432 points of light that are connected to nearly the entire body of human knowledge through the internet, right? That's what you're working with when you're working with a projector. And what do most professors and teachers choose to do with those 786,432 points of light? PowerPoint. <laughs> and PowerPoint helps the presenter remember their notes while do, often doing great harm to the presentation. Uh, if you think about that Dewey question, what do students do in this environment? PowerPoint encourages students to memorize key points, to let the professor decide which points should be key, and then to regurgitate these key points on exams. And to summarize this, you could say that PowerPoint is great for teachers, great for anybody who wants to teach in the sense of dumping information on other people, but it's really bad for learners and it's bad for learning. Or as Edward Tufte says, power corrupts, PowerPoint corrupts us. <laughs> so, if we're going to move students from just being knowledgeable to knowledge able, we're going to have to recognize that knowledge ability is a practice. And as a practice, it's not something that you can put on a PowerPoint slide that says this, you're going to do this, this, and this. You have to create an, envi an environment in which people are inspired to take on that practice because it's really hard. Like, learning is hard, and, and knowledgeability is a practice that's really hard. So you have to create an environment that inspires them to, do, to practice these things. And when we consider the holistic nature of this uh, knowledgeability that I'm proposing here, that it involves communication, thoughtfulness, and empathy, uh, then we really need to transform our model. So the old model is something like what Parker Palmer shows in The Courage to Teach, in which he points out that in this old model, there's like this object uh, through which the, the expert takes in and then distributes to the amateurs. And there's these filters along the way as the expert tries to deliver those things to the amateurs. And he proposes instead this model, uh, in which you organize yourself not around an object, but around the subject. And the reason why he uses the word subject is because he wants you to imagine it as a living thing. It's like this living conversation that's constantly changing and bubbling up. And we are all a part of it. And so all the students become co-knowers along with you. And of course, you may be, have special skills and special assets that are especially important in that environment, but it begins with a respect and an understanding that your students are coming with some of this knowledge as well. And there's this great line here from uh, Maurice Friedman talking about Martin Buber's educational philosophy says, the opposite of compulsion is not freedom, but communion. That is to say that I'm not talking here about creating total chaos in the classroom. I'm talking about creating communion in the classroom. You're not creating freedom, you're creating communion. You're creating a sense of togetherness where you will learn together. So if I could just break this down into three points, and then I'll illustrate those three points with a couple examples from my own classroom, uh, they would be this. The first thing is we have to engage real problems. In any setup, in any classroom, I would never start with technology. Instead, you start with a real problem. And real problem, uh, there are really two things to determine whether or not it's real. One is it has to be real outside the classroom. It can't be just a problem that's real and relevant to, to what you're doing within your discipline. It has to go beyond the classroom. Secondly, a real problem is something you don't know the answer to, which is really hard for teachers to take on. But like. You actually, if it's a real problem, it's something you don't know the answer to. And that makes part two actually really easy, because then you do it with students. You engage these real problems with students. And if you engage a real problem, that is a problem you don't know the answer to, you find that you're naturally a student again. You're naturally learning again, because you have to learn all this stuff too. 
And then finally, the third thing also flows very sort of naturally from that first point and the second point, and that is you harness the relevant tools. You don't just grab tools because they're cool, you grab tools because they're the right tool for what you're trying to do. And so I'll just show you some examples from my classroom. This is a small undergraduate class. Um, so I got about 15 students in this class. This is how we run things there. You'll see that this is what most professors would call a syllabus. We instead call it a research schedule. And it's editable by anybody. It's on a wiki and anybody can edit it at any time. And basically on the first day of class we talk about our goals, what we want to achieve. And then we set that real problem aside. And we say this is what we're going to do. This is a real thing we all want to do. And we need to do this, this, and this to get there. So let's make the schedule together. So here's the schedule. Throughout the semester, students, as they're doing their research or as they're working on this problem, they'll often realize that we forgot something in our early planning stages. And they say, you know what, we're also going to need to know this, or we're going to have to do this. And they put it in the schedule. And as soon as they do, an alert goes out to all the students. They can see what change that student made. And they can come in and they can discuss it. And they can say, no, you know, we don't have time, or, you know, and so on. It's a constant collaboration with the schedule itself. Here you see the updates come into our sort of home base. We use, all these things are free tools, I'll just point that out right now. Um, so this is from wetpaint.com. It goes into, uh, and this goes into netvibes.com, which sort of tracks all of our RSS feeds and so on. Uh, here's a good example from early on in our work, just to give you an idea of what it looks like um, in terms of reading assignments. Real simple thing, right? Normally, a reading assignment is something the teacher gives to the student. And, you know, here's two or three readings, read these and come back and we'll discuss them. When you have a real problem, uh, you go about it a little bit differently. And what we do is we set up this thing on Etherpad, or you can use Google Docs, whatever you want. It's some collaborative space. And we just say, go read everything we need to know to solve this problem. And, like, obviously, you're, you yourself are not going to be able to read everything, but you'll be able to read some little piece of it. And the other 14 people in the room will read other pieces. They all have this little chat going on in the right-hand side over here. And what they're doing over here is summarizing the work that they're finding. And through this method, we were able to, within the first two weeks of class, collectively, we had read 94 articles and books. Whereas normally, as a class, we would have read like three to five articles and books. We had instead read about 94, which represented the bulk of the literature that we had to connect with and respond to for our research project. Uh, in the meantime, students are also uh, having blogs. The blogs posts show up automatically over here. Those of you who are interested in how this works, um, you can see all these blogs that are coming up here. Uh, a great example of why it's important to blog out in public or why it can be a useful thing. Here a student has simply posted a review of different literature that's relevant to their project. One of the people who is mentioned in the review, a very like uh, sort of esteemed author at Columbia University, wrote in and said, oh, you know, you should also check out this, because he saw his name show up in the blog post. So here he's actually collaborating with the very people that he's, he's researching. Um, the way this works is we, I allow students to blog anywhere they want. They can, they can even do uh, just anything that produces an RSS feed they can use. And then I can take the RSS feed, I put it into a Yahoo pipe, and that Yahoo pipe collects everything and spits it out onto this little post here. So the moment somebody posts anything anywhere on whatever their platform they're using, it shows up here. We do the same thing for comments as well. And then over on the right over here, we've got a Digo group, uh, which is just a way that people can share links. Uh, delicious works as well. You can also merge those with Yahoo Pipes if you're interested. I like Digo because people can actually like highlight things on the page. They can leave notes to each other. So we have all these little conversations emerging all over the web, and that conversation and all those links are tracked over here. So this becomes like our little research hub. And meanwhile, students are going out and they're connecting with the whole world through new media. So here's a student who's doing a project, uh, and she just did her interview questions on YouTube. And within a day, she had seven responses. It was like she interviewed <coughs> seven people all over the world in one day just by using YouTube. Then we come together, and this is that process of feeling like you're together, like there's this communion happening. Instead of everybody just doing their own project, we all come together and co-edit this massive paper um, that we hope to publish one day, that we all create on a Google document. That becomes the platform on which we, or the sort of baseline for creating a video. Each of the students creates their own little five-minute video that's a piece of a final documentary 
Uh, this one in particular uh, becomes the anthropological introduction to YouTube, which some of you may have seen. Uh, has over a million views. Uh, it was reviewed in the New York Times. All of this, you know, think of the contrast here between, say, the Scantrons or even the Blue Books where you're writing the essays and then all that stuff goes in the trash. Here we're actually producing a real project for the real world that we hope is of value to other people. So now trans transfer that into the big class, which is a lot more challenging and a little bit closer to what a lot of you might face because these are uh, students who are just fresh out of high school. And in this situation, uh, I'm teaching anthropology, which is the study of all humans in all times and all places. So I'm not teaching technology by any means, and so you know that really has to be secondary. Anthropology is what we're teaching. So here's what we do, though. Here's how we leverage the technology. Uh, what we do is we create. Uh, all these students are asked to go to these different, uh, essentially imagine themselves to be in these different places, and they become experts on these different places. So instead of me just having to know everything. We distribute the knowledge throughout the room. All these students build up their knowledge about these different places, and their job becomes to know everything about that place for the past 12,000 years, roughly. Uh, they build all this on a wiki. So here's the Cultures of Spring 2010. Uh, they can edit this at any time. They build up these massive sort of storehouses of information about these different places around the world. And then this is where it gets really interesting, because as these students are learning about these different places around the world, they start to ask really good questions, really important questions. Like, why is it that 1.3 billion people are living on less than a dollar a day, 3 billion living on less than $2 a day, 800 million are undernourished, over 27,000 children will die of poverty today. And the question the whole class starts to revolve around is why. And all these students become, in some way, they know the answer collectively, or they know part of the answer collectively. And somehow we just have to bring that out. So what we do is we create a world simulation. There are now, along with experts in these different areas around the world, uh, there's also experts in economy, there's experts in politics and so on. And all these people get together in little groups and they create rules for a simulation, which we do in a large ballroom like this. Sometimes we do it in a rodeo arena. We do any place where we can get the space to do it. And you'll see, you know, we have whole economies that emerge around, we use sometimes rather silly props and things, but like, you know, you saw the Fruit Loops and, and so on. Here's, in this particular case, Fruit Loop necklaces came to represent wealth, and those were traded all over the world. And I'll just give you a sense of what this looks like in, in video form, because in the end, this whole thing is filmed on 20 different cameras by 20 different students, who then edit it into these five-minute chunks, which then come to me, and then I edit it down into the final video. And this is what one of these things looks like. Um, this is a 20-minute video compressed down into about three minutes, so it's going to move pretty fast. Uh, you'll see we also use Twitter so that students can send updates from around the room as they happen. We're basically trying to simulate the last 600 years of world history so we can understand how the world works and how we ended up in this place. So here we start with colonization. You see these core regions going out and colonizing these different places. And this is not an act, you're not just acting out history, this is actually a simulation based on rules that the students have developed based on anthropological theories. <coughs> and you'll see that in the midst of all of this, there are mixed in real documentary footage, which students have found that they thought represented what was happening during our simulation. So here you'll see some rebellions starting to occur. The whole world has been colonized by roughly the year 1850, and now a bunch of, there's decolonization occurring, people having rebellions around the world, and you can see some of them are successful. But then one of the core countries realizes that they can rule the world without colonies. They create this economic imperialism, which matches a lot of what we see in the real world anyway. So that's a good job there. Then we bring in a documentary explaining what is happening here.
justice based on falsehood, based on taking away the right and freedom of people to live as high with dignity. But eventually, when you call it back, the tables turn. scene you saw all my students and we looked at like the questions that they were asking and they were really disappointing you know there are questions like how many points is this worth what do we need to know for this test i'd like to point out that while this process that i just showed you is sort of destined to failure when it begins there is one great success of it no matter how the simulation turns out the success of it all is that the students stop asking what do we need to know for this test and they start asking what do we need to know for this test